after 300 hours of gameplay, or 1,356 days, I can finally consider this colony complete. So that naturally means it's time for a world tour. My initial goals for the colony were to get all of the achievements, which, as you can see on the Phoenix Project, every single one of them on the side here have been achieved, and that was completed all the way back at day 1000. Well, 1001, I missed it by one day, because these gas humans did not want to get tamed in time. But anyway, after I got that goal, I figured there was more I could do with this world, so what did I do in those 356 days? Well, I make everything automated in the colony so that my dupes have to do nothing and can just sit back and relax and generally try not to die. So my goal for this world tour is to show what all my world has, how it works, how everything works together, and why it took 356 more days after my 1000 day series ended. So first I'm going to start with a general overview of what is in this world and then go into more specific detail. So starting here, this is the sanctuary where the dupes can just relax and try to re reduce their stress. And that's connected to the main hub of the base where I have all of my corrals with all the animals in the game, different kitchen areas, places to sleep, crop plots, and atmosphere ports for the dupes to suit up and leave to the exterior of the world. So this is the main hub where the dupes can come and do most of all their operations without having to leave. And then sauntering on down is our industrial district where we can get more of the refined material for construction of more advanced machines. Then there's the rest of the world that kind of sprawled out, our water reservoir, a battery bank to keep the power going during nights, some cool steam vents to bring in the water to the colony. Then down this way should be our igneous rock generator to feed our hatches. And then going all the way down to the bottom of the world, I have a geothermal power system that harnesses the arcane energy of hell to give my base energy for light bulbs. And of course, most importantly is the oil. Oil is one of my favorite things of the game just because I'm American, of course I got like oil. So oil wells to give me oil down here. Then some natural gas vents that I can tie into up here where I have some natural gas generators, another natural gas vents. And that's most of what is on the right side of the base. Here's a hydrogen generator area for more power. Then there's a water bank for polluted water to be converted into regular water. And down here are just some more vents to harness. A leak oil fisher vent, a molten slickster corral, a chlorine vent, along with the polluted water vent, which is the most important one of the colony. And strewn throughout are some cold biomes for me to get the sleep wheat, so all those are tapped with ladders leading everywhere for my dupes to access the sleep wheat once it's harvest. So that's a bulk of what's inside of the asteroid. So now it's moving on to the outside, where I have an atmos suit port for them to take off their suits, go up here, put on either a jetpack or an atmos suit, depending on their task. Go to the surface where we have some solar panels with space scanners to see if there's meteor showers. Solar panels produce power to run the base. Then there are some auto sweepers paired with robo miners to mine out debris from meteors and sweep it up, sending it back into the base to be stored. Then going further up, there is all the bunker tiles leading across the top of the world to keep us safe from the asteroids by closing from a signal from the space scanner. And finally, and probably the coolest part, is my three-tier rocket system to explore everything there is in space. And at this point, everything is already explored. It's just a matter of harnessing the materials, specifically steel or thermium. So that is generally all that there is to the colony. Now it's just a matter of how does all this work together and make my dupes have to do essentially nothing. So first, I think we should move over to our water reservoir. I think everything essentially starts with the water. So here is our clean water area. Dupes can either offload it with a bottle emptier, or there are multiple inputs here. So this is quite a bad network of water, but we made it work. So most importantly is to understand the priority of how this is filled up. 
So there are hydro sensors to determine when the water level is low enough to start opening this vent to have water coming in. So first, this hydro sensor is going to go off, tell this liquid vent to open to where it's linked to a water sieve that's linked to the polluted water that gets cleaned in the sieve, turned to clean water. So where do we get this good old polluted water from? Well, there are multiple sources following this pipe here back to its source it is fairly far away and of course leads through the middle heart of the base and is quite confusing but it leads to our polluted water storage bank because the geysers do actually run out of activity as you can see it is actually online right now and providing us water and it is the polluted water vent so this is the main source of our water and it's been doing a pretty good job but that isn't always enough for our system because we consume a lot. The other sources of polluted water can come from here, which is our natural gas generators, which take in the natural gas from this vent here, go up, store it in this massive storage bank of gas reservoirs because I kind of went a little bit overboard. So we have one natural gas vent up here, going down a little bit down our elevator, there is another one down here. So there are two natural gas geysers linked together to power these natural gas generators, which produce power going into our main heavy watt wire line feeding the rest of our base. And as a byproduct, lets out polluted water, which I bring back to the polluted water reservoir. And that is also not quite enough. So we gotta follow this pipe down. It's a little bit jumbled in there, but we made it work and it is connected to our industrial district right here underneath of the petroleum generator. So this generator takes in a source of petroleum, which is made by the oil refinery, which has to take in oil which comes from various means that I'll cover later. So that's where our polluted water comes from. And that is our main input. And if this were to ever run low, we need to have clean water come in. So that is either from this cool steam vent here, going into this pump into the reservoir, or this cool steam vent down here, doing the same thing in its own pipe network leading up to the reservoir. Of course, enough is never enough. So if this joint section right here, that is our connection of the top and the bottom cool steam vent going into this liquid vent is not enough. This vent in the middle, which can pick up the slack, which it hasn't actually ever had to pick up the slack. The other ones have been more than enough. And if we follow this all the way back to the base, there is a desalinator in the slickster stable that is linked to salt water, which you can probably guess now is linked to the salt water geyser, which is overflowing and has never been used, but we could use it if needed. So that is all of the water inputs into base. Quite a bit, quite jumbled, but that's how it works. Now, some of those come at different temperatures, so the temperature does need to be controlled, which is done by this pump here. It takes the water at the bottom, goes through here, into an aqua tuner which essentially has a liquid pipe sensor that senses the temperature and tells it hey i am cool enough i don't need to be cooled so it goes around the aqua tuner or if it needs to be cooled it goes through it and is cooled down and then it goes through cools the steam turbine goes back up cools our battery bank then goes through and gets deposited back into the water reservoir where we can see temperature wise, we are at 20.8 degrees C. So extremely cold and very good, but not very good on food poisoning. I, it has a negligible effect on the dupe, so they just kind of deal with it. So now why is this water important? Well, it is taken out of this liquid pump, shuttled to the base, to our electrolyzer system or more accurately, a SPOM, a self-powered oxygen machine, where the electrolyzer is taking water, spew out oxygen, hydrogen. Hydrogen is soaked up by the top gas pump, sent for power, which is the self-power part. It powers these electrolyzers and the gas pumps, which at the bottom take in the oxygen and distribute in the three lines. This middle one here leading to the right side of the base. So inside this column, 
and then another vent leading to this column of the base. So essentially splitting it right down the middle so the water goes from the middle outward to all the extremities. Which you can see we are very oxygen rich so we are sitting pretty. But we don't just use the oxygen for our dupes. If we try to tag one of these lines we can see that it leads up. So it connects to the atmos suits which require oxygen for them to be breathable and actually have the dupes use them. So these get fueled up with oxygen so dupes can go outside and do tasks. Along with these atmos suits there also has to be oxygen pumped into the sanctuary up above. And there are some other oxygen purposes where we pump it up here, take a little shoot off, and is vented into the dense puff stable where they they breathe in oxygen, poop out oxalite, auto sweeper picks it up, puts it in a conveyor loader, then it gets sent down the line and all the way up over here where it gets sent a drop chute, sent down to where it can get stored in a storage bin or sit on the floor because this is an overpressurized room so it won't off gas. And the last use for the oxygen is going to the surface where there are more atmos supports for them to get into the airlock system than oxygen for the suits used on the surface. And loosely linked to the water system over on this side we can see a water line. This is coming straight from one of the cool steam vents. So where it teed off to go to the water reservoir it also tees off and goes to the surface of the asteroid where it gets to be used in this oxygen generating machine where it does the exact same spews out hydrogen spews out oxygen gets sent down to where it gets put in this container and is turned into a liquid same goes for the hydrogen and these liquids are used to be pumped into this hydrogen rocket on the right and the liquid oxygen is used in all of the rockets including the two petroleum ones on the side which you can see we have more than enough oxalite so that's why you can see these doors here when there is too much oxygen it's just sent out to space and yeeted but it was also meant to be used to be sent back to the colony but this rocket is a little toasty so it keeps breaking the vent line. I'm not low on oxygen so I haven't fixed it. Now as for how it becomes a liquid it's the same as the other aqua tuner where I have a coolant. This time is super coolant which can never freeze because hydrogen and oxygen require extremely cold temperatures. So this liquid is at negative 270 degrees. So quite cold which goes through the aqua tuner determines if it's too hot then it goes through it and you can see they're all going through it or if it's too cold it goes around and this is in a room filled with water where it gets sucked up into the steam vent up here where it takes it the steam version through the floor and turns it into water sends it as a liquid to the bottom and then it just repeats the cycle. So I have two of them one for the oxygen system and one for the hydrogen system. So it's a jumbled mess as usual but sometimes chaos is good. So that's how the hydrogen rocket works. So we can use that as a segue for where we use petroleum and how we get it. So if we follow these petroleum lines across the entire surface of the asteroid we can see we have some storage tanks and it's also being put into these jet suits so the dupes can fly and do tasks if they're outreach such as maintenance on these mesh tiles or the miners. So that the rockets are the main use of the petroleum but there are other uses such as being used in our industrial district where we have molecular forge that uses it for making super coolant or visco gel and then the other resources we get from space we can make thermium using neobium and tungsten or insulite from isoresin, abyss light, and reed fiber. Which, speaking of reed fiber, there's a part of the base that doesn't work anymore, but worked enough. We had a huge thing of reed fibers that soaked up so much water. There used to be a water lake up here and a water lake down here. So we got reed fiber and we needed that for the rockets because these pipes that are carrying the hydrogen to the rocket really wanted to break a lot because there was heat transfer and while going from here to the rocket it changed state and broke the pipes. So now that it's made of insulite and no longer breaks. 
and that was the only application I needed. Absolutely no heat transfer, so Insulite isn't really needed anymore. So moving back to our industrial district, that's essentially the molecular forge explained. We have a metal refinery that gets all the metals shipped to it from our smooth hatches, which will be discussed later. And it's mainly just used for making steel, which you can see we don't have any resources right now. And then the last part of the industrial district is the oil refinery, which takes in the oil, turns it into petroleum, gets sent down in the storage tanks, gets sent up to be used in the petroleum generator that gives us power, which is put onto the heavy watt wire line feeding across the entire colony and to our base. So those are the machines in there, but these machines are really hot and they need to be cooled. So we have even more cooling systems. There is one here and one here. So why are there two? Well, we can start with this one on the bottom where it works the exact same way as the ones at the top, except its whole purpose is to take water from this polluted water reservoir, send it to the cooling tank to be cooled down, gets sent through, cooled down, goes back, and deposited right back into reservoir. Where is then sensed for the temperature. If it is below 20 degrees C, it is then sent up through the industrial district to be used as a coolant for the metal refinery because it needs to be cooled and if the liquid were to overheat, it would break everything. Now, as for the other line, it is a completely closed loop where it is keeping the industrial district cooled, cold enough where the machines don't overheat, which you can see it's actually doing a pretty dang good job. Probably too good of a job, but it's good enough. And this is linked directly to the bottom of the base, so the dupes don't have to put on atma suit, so they might get a little angry with 7 degrees C temperatures, but they'll get over it and they don't really complain too much. Now as for the outputs, you saw the polluted water that gets sent back to the water reservoir, but there are also some bad gases, which is actually doing really good right now because it's overpressurized with the oxygen inside the rest of the base. So all the carbon dioxide has the output from the petroleum generator or the oil refinery gets sent over here, fall down because of the trickle stairs and gets sent up to the colony where the carbon gets sent to the slicksters to eat and the oxygen is just redistributed to the base through a vent. And as you'll see, it works throughout the whole base. There are metal tiles everywhere. This increases the speed of the dupes along with the plastic stairs leading everywhere, even inside the main hub of the colony. And for them to get bottled petroleum, which was used for the super coolant in the molecular forge, I have a little trough here that just spits out petroleum and they can bottle it with a pitcher pump. So that's our industrial district in a nutshell. Except where is the single most input, the oil? Well, we can start with going down this line, which goes on back to our leaky oil fissure which just produces at regular intervals, trickles down. We have a thermium liquid pump that shouldn't overheat, and I don't think it has yet, but you can see there is a liquid pipe broken. I don't need that oil anyway, because I have two other sources. If we go back here, this up route, it has two branches up that go off of it, one down, one up. The one that goes up is from our slicksters, which eat all the carbon from the dupes that breathe out and the carbon of our industrial district. So they're fed more than enough. We can see it's filled to the brim with carbon dioxide. They breathe it in, spew out oil, it's taken up, sent down there, and it's actually backed up. And if the slicksters weren't able to produce enough, we go back down to the oil biome where we have our not so massive oil lake anymore, but big enough that's fed by oil wells that take yet another water input to be sent in there along with electricity that spews out oil. And if that fails, I do have some wild slicksters here that require absolutely no maintenance and don't die from a lack of food. So they're just fat chilling, giving me oil for free. So from here, that's where all the water is used and its impact on our manufacturing, but there is also power generation. So probably my favorite one is the geothermal power, where there's hot magma on the bottom, 
There are steel tiles that will not overheat. They are linked to mechanized airlocks, which when they are open, do not transfer heat because they are in a vacuum. So these doors are the only heat transfer point, which are linked to a metal tile. So they are triggered to close and transfer heat by this automation line that will trigger whenever the temperature below 180. So whenever the steam in here is below 180, it isn't optimal steam production. So it needs to get heated up and whenever steam is needed, which you can see is turned off right now because we have enough stored up in our system to where this battery isn't giving it an automation signal to turn on all of these steam generators. But if they were going to be needed, these would close, this would get heated up, steam would go into these steam turbines, which would get toggled on by the automation line and produce a heap ton of power, which you can see has actually affected the temperature of the magma, which is at 1500 degrees C here, as opposed to the 1564 and the rest of the biome. So about seven degrees colder where we're at. So it isn't infinite, but it's essentially infinite. So there is one power source, which is connected to heavy watt wire that goes into a transformer to downgrade it to power whatever machines are down here, which in this case is just an aqua tuner, which works the same way as the other ones, has super coolant going through it, cools it down when needed because these steam turbines would eventually overheat if they weren't cooled. So the super coolant is keeping it nice and cold with radiant pipes. So moving on from that, we talked about this a little bit earlier. There's a petroleum generator. It's straightforward, it takes in petroleum, generates power, sends the heavy watt wire, and it's done. Now as for other power generation, I talked about briefly, there's a self-powered oxygen machine which has extra hydrogen. It's marginally more power, but it is some. Then there's a natural gas generator that should be out the polluted water and is fueled by two of the natural gas geysers stored up in the gas reservoirs. And then there is also the hydrogen over here, which spews out a ton of of hydrogen which is superheated at a really hot temperature which is why the pump is made out of thermium so it doesn't overheat and can take out the hydrogen send it to some storage reservoirs and is pumped to even more hydrogen generators which are actually running at this moment and those are kind of the extremity power generation there's also inside the base some cold generators which get the cold dropped into them which you can see there's another shipment which just comes straight from our hatches, which eat food, poop out coal, and we have more than enough coal, essentially infinite supply, with the auto sweeper picking up the coal and putting it into the different generators. And as a byproduct, it produces carbon dioxide, which is definitely the main feeder for the slicksters, because you can see it's a continuous trickle of small packets that can get fed into the slickster stable through this vent and they can eat it up. And they require a certain hot temperature, which is why I have this heater running all the time, kind of inefficient, but they need to stay warm or they won't have slickster eggs and their population will dwindle because they'll have glossy slicksters instead, which only breathe oxygen, so they eventually starve. And as kind of a backup, everything's not working power generation, I do have this line here, which is linked to some manual generators, so dupes can go to it and generate power if absolutely needed but that's only feasible if the batteries are at 20% of their max load. So they have to be really low to warrant a dupe running on a manual generator. And with all these batteries over here storing power, it doesn't generally get that low. Mainly because of our big power source, our solar panels on the surface. They're exposed to the surface, which has a huge amount of light going down, powering them since they have direct contact to it with the bunker doors at the top being open. So all of them you can see are producing power. It's starting to go over tonight, so not at max capacity on the same line, which is only loaded to 10.4 kilowatts, but can be loaded to 27 kilowatts. So not ideal, but it hasn't broken yet. So the solar panels are the main breadwinner of the base, which is why there's all this infrastructure to keep them safe. So they have direct line sight to the light, even though there's mesh tile here because he can see through them and the mesh tile's there to catch any of the debris from meteors that were to 
hit the bonkers, build up, get dropped down onto the mesh tile, which then would build up, block the lights, and not produce any power. So it has to be removed. So the miners each have a field of mining that can mine it out, and the auto sweeper picks it up puts it into this conveyor loader, sends it all the way down the line, which can go all the way back to the base and be dropped right at the door where they put on their Atma suits. And that's because up at the surface, there's a bunch of regolith, but when it's a fresh load of meteors, there's actually iron, copper, and sometimes gold that falls here, which if we look at the filters is the only thing I'm telling it to pick up. So it will never pick up this regolith that's basically useless. So that's how it mines, picks up, and I use the material and how these are protected. But how do these bunker doors determine to close and open when there's only a meteor shower? That's because there's an automation wire that goes through all of them that is green right now, which turns red through the knot gate. That's being read by all of the space scanners to get full coverage to tell it when to close because they will sense when there's a meter shower, send the signal as a warning, and they all close. And this would be the reason why the power overloads, because all these closing at the same time would not be good, which is why I have it broken up into one segment right here that goes down, a second segment in the middle, and a third segment on the side. So all these work on a time delay that goes back to a power transformer. So if we go to the middle one, follow it down, and we'll eventually find there is a large power transformer, which takes power from the main line, so all our power generating methods, and tones it down to 2000 watts, and is linked to an automation timer, which for the three separate segments, it runs and is off for two thirds of the time and off for one third. So at any given point, only one third of our bunker tiles will be opening at one time because of this timer. It's kind of jank, but it's been working and I had a huge problem trying to figure this out, but this was the most elegant solution I could think of. Because you can see these are all powered here, but these all have the red battery marks, so they are not powered along with the one on the far right. But this one right here is always powered so that this solar panel will get sunlight and can provide some amount of power to close them in case of emergency. And moving on down to our last power generation method is our shine nymphs. Yes, literal lightning bugs, which are stationed in the middle. And if they weren't miserable, crowded, or cramped would be producing power, which they shine, light up, the solar panels soak it up and send the power to the main line. So that is all of our power that runs and dictates that our base will actually be online. So now we will move on to what all of the animals we have are and how they are helping us. So the shine nymphs, they just purely produce power sometimes. So essentially the way I have it working is there's an automation line that connects to a critter sensor. And if the amount of shine nymphs inside the stable are above six, so seven is max capacity where they won't make any more eggs and six is right there where they can still make eggs and the eggs they do produce can go into here because this chute behind the shine nymphs will open, which is fed to the brimless shine nymph eggs, which is linked to the auto sweepers inside this small area here. But there are also one and two sweepers inside the stable itself, which pick up eggs all the time, send them on up to the top of the base and go out through the chute where they're right at the incubators where they can be turned into shine nymphs to speed up the process by being inside of an incubator. And you can see there's one flying around right here. So somehow he escaped. There's also escaped hatches and stuff like that. So that's not new. He can get wrangled up, put into here and they are sorted. But in general, the shine nymph should just be stuck inside of the incubator. The dupe should be signaled to take it if the stable can take another occupant. But if it can't, we can go back up to the incubator where we can see this other auto sweeper and the loader here. So either A, it's going to go into this incubator, which has a higher priority. So it will be put there over the conveyor loader. So if it's full, it will instead be put into the conveyor loader where it gets sent down 
and pass the check of I do not need to be incubated and can be sent to the power fields. So that's my kind of method of getting jank power from lightning bugs. Not very effective, but fun. Shinums also do take food, which is phosphorite, which is fueled by the Dracos. Dracos poop out phosphorite by eating mealwood. Now, mealwood takes dirt, and dirt is produced by my nifty little pips, which I currently have one and a ton of eggs strewn around everywhere. These pips, they eat arbor trees, poop out dirt. Dirt's picked up by these auto sweepers, sent down another line to be stored into the chute, drops down, auto sweeper here, puts it into the storage, and can be taken out, dispensed into the meal wood to be grown. So aside from producing phosphorite, the Drecos also give reed fiber, which was for the Ensolite. They're not the best at it, but they do give enough to be valuable. And they just get sheared on this machine and groomed by the grooming station. And the same can go for my glossy Drecos up here. They're just Drecos, but shiny. And they eat bristle berries, which is fueled by water. So yeah, another thing fueled by water. And they could produce plastic, but that's a little bit of a headache with hydrogen or something. So I'm not about to mess with that. So that's the Shine Nymphs and the Drecos completely symbiotic relationship then with only dirt and water as an input. And these pips are not requiring any attention except for polluted water to feed the arbor trees, which are from the polluted water geyser, which is fed by the storage tanks. And the other critters that eat polluted water to an extent are the puffs, which have a little valve here, which dispenses polluted water on the floor, which off gases to give them enough polluted oxygen to eat and enough being micrograms of it. So barely enough to keep them alive and they poop out polluted dirt, which can be picked up by this auto sweeper put into here. As an output from the water sieve, there's polluted dirt. That polluted dirt is picked up by the auto sweeper put into the conveyor, which then takes the polluted dirt, sends it on to the same line as the chutes and the polluted dirt from the puffs and the water sieve go over go down a little bit can get filtered out so the slime is sent down and dispensed to the sage hatches which that is their only food supply and the sage hatches eat the slime produce coal for the coal generators and also food which i'll explain the hatches later now as for the other output of the solid filter the polluted dirt goes through and up here dispensed out to the pokey shells which eat the pile of polluted dirt. Then when they eat it, they poop out sand and that sand gets picked up and sent either in this top loader or this bottom loader. So looking closely, the top loader picks up pokey shell molt and small pokey shell molt and the bottom loader sends out the sand. So the sand is sent out, it goes over and ironically actually goes exactly back to the water reservoir where it's dispensed out, stored in the storage bin where there's 17 tons of sand. Sand is used in the water sieve to clean the water. So water sieve makes polluted dirt, gets sent over to pokey shells, they eat it, send back sand, and it's circular cycle. So there's the pokey shell explained of what their purpose is, but they also have pokey shell molts, which are sent over to be processed in the rock crusher because their molts can actually be made into lime, which then gets sent down the shipping line into our industrial district, which is used to make steel. And the refined carbon is also sent from up back in our base, right next to the rock crusher, the kiln. So this auto sleeper here picks it up, puts it in the loader, sends it through this winding line. It's kind of hard to follow, goes down and drops out. Now as for the other input of the refinery, there were the smooth hatches I referenced earlier. They eat raw metal, poop out refined metal, which I have been picked up with this auto sweeper where they get sent into this conveyor loader, go over, get teed on to the refined carbon and the lime line. So you get your steel, lime, refined carbon, all drop out the same chute and put it into the machine with an auto sweeper. So steel is 100% on May with the smooth hatches, the pokey shell producing the molt, and there's coal, which is shoved into the kiln. So my dupes can just fetch that from the hatch stables. 
and may as well cover these guys. They aren't very important. They're squeaky puffs instead of just puffs. They eat chlorine gas, which when they eat it, they off put bleach stone, which is used in our geotuners to geotune our cool steam vents, either one of them, so that they produce more water. So I haven't had to do that much because we have so much water coming in. But as for the chlorine, that's from the chlorine vent all the way down in the bottom left corner. And that's the only use of chlorine. So figured may as well use it. And now that we're back at the base, it looks like we've gone through all of the different critters that I have. Only thing left is there are stone hatches. I have two stables of them, sage hatches and regular hatches. So sage hatches eat the slime from the puffs and the stone hatches eat igneous rock and output coal as well. Igneous rock is made from our little machine over here, an igneous rock generator. The volcano erupts, magma goes out, and makes a little blade, which this door lets it seep through. When it cools, it pops into this chamber, which has steam in it, cooled by a thermo aqua tuner. And whenever it gets in here, it gets picked up by the off sweeper, goes in a little merry-go-round, where it gets to soak up all the heat, get cooled down, and when it's cool enough, I drop it out up here into this beautiful pool of super coolant and actually liquid methane because I let the temperature get a little out of control here at negative 120 degrees and this was hot like this area here but now is extremely cold. These produce power for the system as well and just determine when to send the igneous rock out of it. I'm not entirely sure if I've actually gotten any igneous rock actually out of here, but in theory I should. But since there's so much igneous rock in this planet, I'm sitting at 44.1 tons, so that's more than enough for two stables filled with stone hatches. And if I actually did get desperate, I would actually resort to launching my rockets with their cargo bays to pick up some igneous rocks from a rocky asteroid, which I actually have plotted right now, mainly for the neomium on the planet, but it does pick up igneous rock as well. So the rockets just are meant for shipping. I no longer need research, so they're all just spec to have liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen in this one, petroleum in these two, and blast off to wherever I need resources. And as for these stone hatches, this goes for all the hatches as well. Their drops are just picked up by an auto sweeper, which puts it into a loader and then goes up and gets sent to the coal generators. So I have four stables worth of hatches that are just producing coal and that's used for power. Now, hatches are goaded. I love hatches because they produce power and they produce meat. This loader right here, if there's an egg, it can be sent in this chute and go out through this chute where you can see this huge pile of stone hatch eggs. So when there are extra stone hatch eggs, they are sent out here and not kept in the stable so that the stone hatches or other hatches can always produce eggs and never be hindered by a cap of entities. So if I do need more of them, this auto sweeper picks up the eggs like, hey, I'm gonna save you. Puts it in an incubator so we have regular hatch, sage hatch, stone hatch, smooth hatch incubator. We have a nymph incubator and a molten slickster one because they were almost extinct, but we saved them. So these incubators keep the population going. They break out every now and then. If they aren't saved and used to repopulate, they just kind of can't breathe in water and produce meat, which this sweeper here picks it up, puts it in this chute, sends it all the way down where it gets dropped out in the kitchen for either Otto or Liam to cook it up into barbecue. And when they are done with the barbecue, the sweeper picks it up off of the ground or from the refrigerators, puts it in a chute, and it gets sent all the way up. Through the chute, you can see some frost buns in there. They're heading on up to the sanctuary where they get dropped out, stored in these refrigerators. So these refrigerators hold only finished food items. So the dupes can go in here, get their food, slide down the pole, go to either shift one, two, or three lunch area to eat. And then once they eat, they can go dance in their free time or get a massage if they're stressed. 
And of course, I tell them to wash their hands always if they're going to use the restroom. And the sanctuary area should be one of the most happy places. So yeah, it's maxed out at 120. So we are looking really good. And that's linked to the main area of the base. Now, as for the other food, since we got distracted from the hatches, there's the frost buns I referenced earlier, which essentially are just going to the cold biomes. The dupes can pick up sleet wheat, bring it on back by going up the ladders, dropping it off in the kitchen, and then it gets cooked up in the frost bun. So frost bun, barbecue, and bristleberry are the main food supply, which we grow bristleberry here and two crop plots, which is fed by water. Another consumer of water, which is essentially infinite, and bristleberry is not a bad food to eat. And whenever the bristleberry is harvested, it gets picked up, put in the chute, sent over. You can see it in the line actually right now, and actually go down, drop out of the chute, and be cooked up. So went on a little tangent there, but that's our entire food system, and we also finished all of the animals that I have. Except I forgot <laughs> another one that's kind of slept on is the tropical Paku, well, or Paku in general. These are just fish, they grow up. Whenever they die from old age, the meat's swept up and sent over to the kitchen as well. Now, as for how they're fed, that's the beautiful thing. I don't even have to try to feed them. They have a fish feeder, which is fed with blossom seed, which is gotten from bristleberry, which I grow way too much of. So we're at 812 units of blossom seeds and that has only been growing. So we will never run out of food for the Paku. So we'll have some food trickling in from there. So now the only thing left is actually what the dupes live in. So I described the sanctuary up here. That's just for them to relax at the end of the day, eat atmospheres for them to leave to the hostile environment so they're protected and not unhappy by breathing polluted oxygen. And then there's stables on our side. There's columns of plastic ladders and a fire pole running up and down on both sides of the colony. And start from the top. There are some pedestals with some rocks on it to keep them happy. The kiln and crusher for resources. The incubator area. Hatch killing area. And then there's some bedrooms with comfy beds to keep them nice and happy. And on each bedroom floor, there's two beds on either side kitted out with a painting and a potted plant so that it is a luxury barracks and they have a shower laboratory and sink set up so that they can take a shower use the restroom and be mandated to use the sink and then they have a few beds just kind of strewn here and there a medical area that doesn't get used all that much another layer of beds with a kind of jank bathroom set up because there's a central water reservoir that isn't needed anymore but kind of got adopted just because it's kind of historic so it'd be like destroying a monument if we got rid of it but yep there's the bathroom two beds on either side the geotuners for the cool steam vents a random storage area for sand i think and regolith let's not store regolith and then a skill scrubber which isn't needed anymore that was only for rowan too which if you understand you understand then there's the kitchen set up where they have to wash their hand. They can cook up the four dishes I said earlier. And then the custom bedroom for Liam and Otto are two cooks. Another cooking area if both of them are awake at the same time. Another bed. A little gas storage for excess chlorine because we have had chlorine spills for some reason. And that brings us to the bottom of the base where all the carbon just kind of trickles down with these slopes goes down to the industrial district and gets soaked up. So all the carbon from the dupes they breathe out goes down in the industrial district and soaked up, sent to the slickers to make oil. So here's a little zoomed out view to show what I just talked about. So mostly beds, bathrooms, portal in the middle, cooking area down here, and some niche things along the side. But you can kind of see what we talked about throughout the whole video. It's kind of a jumbled mess, but I think I explained it as best I could. And I guess as a final touch, through all the space flights, we have some cool trinkets like an egg, a glowy stone, a sandstone, some random shields, a watch that we stole off of someone, a Nokia, a few robot arms, a concerning percolator with the R offset to the next row for some reason, a small obelisk, that's a little ominous, and 
the embodiment of modern art, even the kitchen sink. So yeah, I got it all. And the purpose for all these was just to try to make the decor of the outside world a little bit happier because inside the base, everything is nice, cheery with wallpaper background, the metal tile floors for faster speed, a few plants sprinkled everywhere, the temperature control. Oh, temperature control. There is a polluted water line going through the entirety of the base. So this green polluted water is important because dupes put off heat. Heat is bad. So all that line snakes through the entire base gets sent to this one coin unit, which works the exact same as the other ones and then gets sent back and actually splits and goes to cool down the natural gas area because I was concerned with it overheating, but it's not really concerned now with the cooling unit and with the base being sufficiently cooled, it's actually borderline too cold. So oxygen, electricity, temperature, decoration, germs are to a minimum. We just have a shit ton of flowers. So if you're allergic to them, I'm sorry to those dupes. And shipping lines going everywhere, trying to connect things that you wouldn't think are connected to things that are. So you can see where the madness came from and why it's kind of a jumbled mess of everything. Lots of automation trying to connect all the different outputs of the animals and lots of uses of water that you can see now. So I hope this was a good overview of kind of how the colony worked. I'm pretty sure I covered everything, but I imagine I'll forget something. So if I did, I'll probably add it here. OSHA violation. Here is where my glass is made. It is shoved in a random cold biome that I have obliterated. Sand is stored in here. This auto sweeper shoves it in there. This heats up the cold biome, but doesn't overheat the glass forge because it's cooled down and the glass gets taken out, dropped down. Where does it drop down to? Well, falls all the way down into a polluted water pool. So it's a massive pool. It's heated to 50 degrees C. I know it didn't start at that temperature, so I've done a bit of damage. And of course, next to that is the puff that never dies. He's been here since day one, and I know him a few times in my 1000 day playthrough, and he is still alive and kicking. And as a final touch, kind of more lackluster than OSHA violation. This carbon dioxide here is used, but not to feed the slicksters. It's taken out through the gas pump and sent all the way up to actually the surface of the asteroid to where it gets split either to the right where it can be sent in here, which is the storage for the oxalite, so that it's overpressurized because this mechanized airlock would not let the carbon out. And it also acts as a cooling unit because I used to have a rocket in this rocket silo, which no longer is of use. So it's just kind of a little relic. There were bunker doors here, a way to enter on this side, but now it's just covered by glorious solar panels. And it was overheating an auto sweeper, but now there's no more. I got to have my dupes do something so they can move oxalite, which actually isn't used anymore. So why do I have the dense puffs if I'm just using entirely liquid oxygen? So I don't use oxalite. I have it just because. So that means this door will never be open. So carbon is only ever going to leave through this line, which is going to the surface out through this vent to cool down the telescope and the mission control station. Temperature is a little rampant. It's 98 degrees C, so not good. But whenever the carbon dioxide comes out, it's really cold, goes through, takes the heat, gets yeeted into space. Mission control station is useful because it speeds up the rocket travel to the various planets. And as another artifact of my asteroid, there is yet another rocket silo where I had a steam generator about right here, which is now just a hole in space. It was for the steam rocket and I made a huge pool of water just 
because and i'm actually surprised i still have shovels i was certain they died so they probably survived because i forgot about them and quarantined them to this little asteroid there so i knew about them at some point and you may be wondering how is travel time in this asteroid kept to a minimum there's this transit tube here and a transit tube on the right side so dupes can exit through the left or the right side of the base go to this tube network which leads to anywhere imaginable mostly to places like the water reservoir and a bunch of cold biomes so they have a fast travel to the place but they gotta run back because having a tube network to bring them to and from that would be very power intensive and my network can generally not sustain that so with that i hope this was informative and entertaining at the same time not quite as fast paced as my 1000 day series but if you want to go check that out here is a playlist with all four parts and thank you all for watching i'll catch you all next time